All right, so talking about upstreaming, um, and just to kind of begin, I'm not talking. Um, I'm not an expert at this. I just happen to work with open source software. Um, the what I'm going to go about talk about are my own sort of sort of speculations and ideas and opinions. Um, I'd really quite like sort of feedback, um, other comments, and I'll set a timer so I don't go over time. Um, and basically, uh, your opinions, to because there's bound to be things I haven't thought of. Um, so to put that in some context, um, I'm a Koha developer. Uh, Koha is uh, a library management system. Uh, that's libraries with books, not libraries with computer programs. Um, it's used in, we estimate thousands of libraries around the world from uh, kind of developed countries to developing countries. Um, it's totally free software. There's dozens of companies and hundreds of developers all over the world, um, pretty much in almost every continent and almost every time zone working on it. It's not uncommon at all to you know, collaborate on somebody in, I'm in New Zealand, collaborate with somebody in Germany, collaborate, and then a third person in the US to get something through. So it's a very big international um, open source project. I work at Catalyst IT, um, which is a open source focused software company, uh, started in New Zealand, now has offices in, um, well, throughout other parts of New Zealand, Australia, the UK. Um, and we're an open source focused company. Everything we do, we try to get keep as free and open source as we can. So we work with a lot of Moodle, Mahara, Drupal, Koha. Where it's bespoke software, it's built upon uh, Debian, MySQL, PostgreSQL, that sort of thing. So as a result, I'm kind of spoiled. Um, in our performance reviews, how much does this person contribute to the open source sort of uh, community is sort of a line there that we're kind of vetted on. Um, so that's kind of the, the rose-tinted ivory tower that I'm coming from. Um, this talk, however, comes from a slightly different angle. A few years ago, I was giving a talk in uh, a workshop in Malaysia um, on Koha. We had quite a good crowd because it's quite popular, uh, especially in developing countries because proprietary systems cost about that much um, and they can set Koha up on their own. And I got a few questions that people were stuck on, at the time, like six-year-old versions of Koha. They couldn't upgrade. Um, they made sort of changes to the software to suit their needs, which is totally reasonable. That's the purpose of open source, of free and open source software. Uh, changes, changes and modifications is its, its reason for being. Um, but this had given them a bit of a problem. They can't just install, install the new version. Um, they've made so many changes to it that if they just plonk the new version in, then it's not going to work anymore. All their customizations have gone. So they didn't quite know where to go from that, and there is no easy answer uh, from their point of view. The only real thing they can do is throw away all their changes and start again, or port them. Um, both of those are very expensive options. Um, it's fine if you're developing things over sort of a period of six years, but when it t comes time to actually um, upgrade and then you've got to kind of redevelop all these changes in the period of like six months, for most places they just simply can't afford that. So to make sure we're sort of on the same kind of page, um, just a quick definition of what I'm talking about here what it, when I talk about upstreaming. It's if you make changes to a project, it's putting those, pro those changes into the, um, the upstream, pro into the original project that you're using. It's not, um, as happens in some cases, just taking these changes and chucking them over the wall uh, and hoping that somebody picks them up and uh, runs with them. That never happens and never works. Um, it's, if, you, if you look back, you'll see this has happened uh, a few times in mildly recent history with large projects, and uh, it's, it's always been a bit of a failure, and the people who did this have gone back and had to reconsider because everybody was yelling at them. Um, instead, it's taking your fixes, your patches, uh, be what they may, and kind of shepherding them through the process of getting into the upstream project. Um, 
Depending on the nature of the project, this might be as simple as writing a patch, submitting a pull request. If it's a large project, there's going to be process. Um, you're probably going to have to talk to people to get them to review it, um, sign off, QA, make sure your test coverage is good, all that sort of stuff. There's stuff, there's, there is work you have to do. Um, and that's kind of what I mean when I'm talking about upstreaming. So to start with, why? Why, why should you upstream? Um, the biggest thing is you don't have to maintain your own patches anymore. Um, if you've ever had a patch set on top of a project, um, it can get really, really tiresome. We had one that was about 150 patches on top of the core product, and we just got sick of it. Um, it can be it, it can be quite a lot of work to keep them, keep them um, keep them relevant. Re when you do a rebase onto a new version, you're going to have you know a pile of conflicts. It's going to be an awkward and annoying day, or three or week, um, getting everything current again. Um, it's pretty easy to kind of accidentally drop patches on the floor. Like I said, when we had 150, I'm pretty sure I did this a few times. Um, whether it's you think the bug that you're fixing here has been fixed upstream by somebody else, or whether it's um, that you just got this giant list and you accidentally miss out a line when you're copy and pasting or you delete one line too many, it's actually a really easy thing to do. Um, and then that means that you deploy it and people complain because this thing that was working is no longer working and you build it specially for them and what do you know about it and what's going on and who am I anyway? Um, so let upstream take care of it if you can. As soon as you put something into the project, then it's not your responsibility anymore. It's now the responsibility of anybody else who's building stuff to work with what you've put there. Um, and there goes your maintenance headache, hopefully. To coin a word, um, and to put more of a free software rather than open source kind of slant on it, you're making the world a better place. Um, the more free software that is in the world, the more things that are available for people to build on, work with, use, um, <clears throat> make their life better, make the world better. Um, so just giving people things that they find useful is kind of a, a good thing to do. Um, sort of removing all sort of corporate interests and money making from the whole scheme of it. Um, just pushing things out there um, because people are going to use them is good. And if you're lucky, they'll improve on it. They'll make it better, which you can then get in turn and, hey, this thing you built is even better now and more useful for you. Um, features you hadn't thought about implementing, things you just didn't get around to implementing, uh, things you didn't think of that you didn't think you'd, or that you didn't think you'd need that pe other people decide, oh, hang on, I can do this really easily. And now you've got it too. Kind of a bit of a step further, if, you're, if it's a core product of yours, uh, something that's sort of integral to your um, whatever it is you do, or it's something you sell as a service or a product to, to other people, you can become upstream, um, sort of become the, the sort of pro part of the primary group of developers, whatever it is. And this means you can kind of steer the project to a degree. Um, it sounds a little bit selfish, but I don't kind of mean it like that. Um, it means that you can make sure that any decisions that are made aren't going to adversely impact whatever it is you do. Um, as an example, I've been for several years the Koha Debian package maintainer. So I make sure it, it installs and easily into Debian. It's easy to administer. It comes with a bunch of scripts that let you turn on off instances, turn off instances, ties in with the init systems, ties in with this, that, the next thing. And it's because that's how we deploy our systems. Um, so the packaging system means that we can, we can fire up a new call instance for somebody who wants to look at it in about 30 seconds. Uh, whereas it used to take, you know, the better part of half a day. Um, and so because I'm that, that's my role in the community, I can guide how this works. I can make sure that it's always working in a way that we want. Um, and as a nice side effect, other people around the world now use this as their kind of standard deployment mechanism. So it's making life easier for them too. Um, so this can be done by having people come in and be uh, core maintainers of some description, um, developers, release maintainers, even documentation managers, um, that sort of thing. 
another sort of aspect of why it's good to upstream is just plain old vanity. Um, and you'd be surprised how kind of important this can be. Um, it's nice, to just you make something, people are using it. That's great. You see like two people using it, that's pretty awesome. You see a thousand people using it, um, that's even better. You get your name in the project, your name up in lights. Um, whether it's just uh, release notes, um, or just even just knowing that you've got a, you know, patches sitting around in there and it's logged somewhere and some people are seeing it. And it gives you, it can be a bit of resume material, CV material. Um, and you know, there's a chance you're becoming an expert in some particular area of it and people are gonna come to you and um, ask you questions or ask for your input. If you're working for a company, and this one is um, a bit more concrete, you get your company's name in there too. Um, my company, they really like it. They actively encourage that you use your company email address for anything that you're upstreaming. Just because it's, you know, if you're working on behalf of them, it's kind of fair enough. It's good marketing for them. Um, it's likely to attract good staff and it's likely to attract more clients. Um, and speaking of clients, um, they also like having their name in there. So we've got a new thing, well, rather the new thing in Koha, where if you're doing something for a client, in your commit, you put um, a sponsored by sort of note. So if they're paying for an improvement that you're developing, you put their name in there with a little tag in the commit. And that's rolled up when release note time comes around. And so it's quite, quite neat when you, well, especially for the, you know, small town libraries get to, get to sort of a, a thing that thousands of people around the world are seeing, you know, um, this feature is sponsored by South Taranaki District Council or something like that. Um, they really quite like that, uh, surprisingly so. So there's, a, there's obviously gonna be a flip side to all this. Um, there are somewhat valid arguments for not upstreaming and to be fair and balanced, we should cover those too. It is a lot of work. Um, we add kind of a few hours worth of work, depending onto a lot of our uh, quotes, if it's something we know we're gonna upstream, um, just because sometimes it comes back, sometimes you've got to do more work on it, it's not up to community standards for whatever reason. Um, the QA person doesn't like you today. Um, so, and it can take, it can just take time. And probably, the bigger the project, the more time it's gonna take. Um, and it's pr also probable that as the bigger the project, the more likely you're going to be to be contributing stuff to it. Um, you've got to match code guidelines. You've got to um, make sure the, the test coverage is correct. Make sure everything's documented. Um, if you're just doing something internally, you can, probably shouldn't, but you can uh, skimp on some of these things. Um, nobody's going to really notice if you haven't sort of written a proper man page for this command you've added, as long as everybody around you knows what it's doing. Um, and another one that's surprisingly large, I should have probably made it bold or something, but making sure that it's not interfering with other people's use cases. It's qu quite fine for you to push to make a patch that, you know, breaks this feature because you never use this feature like that anyway, you only use it in this other way. Um, but when you're making this thing, when you're trying to get this thing upstream, you've got, you know, thousands of users. Um, I'm not sure what it's like with many projects, but with Koha, every single user is some sort of special butterfly. Um, they have some bit of crazy that they need to work in some specific way inside their system. And if you break that, they get really angry. Um, so we've got to be really careful we don't stomp on other people's toes when uh, trying to make something work upstream. And all these things add up, and they can take a substantial amount of time. Um, another aspect of why people, more companies, are kind of recipient about the idea of upstreaming is just fear. Um, and not strictly in a, you know, a, a 19, like a 2000s, 1990s, 2000s FUD kind of thing, but more just, um, you know, is there some legal liability involved? Uh, is it okay for a company to say, well, here's this thing we pushed, and if it breaks, well, you get to keep both parts. I mean, 
Sure, if you're putting something up, you can quite happily say, no warranty, not my, not my problem if it eats your, eats your socks and <laughs> loses one of your cats. Um, and, but for a company, is it okay? Um, there's, probably, um, there's probably case law on this around the place. I don't actually know the answer. Um, but it is something I could see people being concerned about. Uh, competitive advantage is one that on the surface seems really kind of big and scary, but when you kind of look at it, maybe it's not. Um, most open source stuff is kind of running as part of uh, infrastructure, um, sort of pre-existing systems. Um, it's not your core business thing. And even if it is, you can still separate these things out, I think, to a degree. Um, most of what you release isn't going to be picked up by somebody else, and all of a sudden they're making the millions you could have made. Um, on a similar vein, there's trade secrets. Uh, if we release this, I'll be risking giving out our recipe for our snake oil or something like that. Um, I would argue that things like this should be separate anyway. So you might do development on a rules engine, but the rules, they're probably internal rules anyway. That's where those things should be housed. Um, so when you're looking at these things, you've got to kind of think, are they valid? Um, I mean, it's easy to throw out words that make things seem a bit scary, but if you actually dig down into them, are they, are they correct? Are they good arguments for not doing something? Um, maybe this needs some education. Maybe you need to go look up the case law for your region about free software warranties, if that exists, and say, well, no, if it's perfectly fine. There's, there's, ver there's ne a negligible chance of sort of come back on this. Um, and it, so it's definitely worth the gain that it'll get us in the long term. Kind of another one that, and this one is probably the most valid in my opinion, is that your customizations are just totally local. There's no use for anybody else to use them. Um, and this is the most common one that I end up having to deal with. Um, so you've got to kind of look, can you just generalize them? Um, so, as a sort of a concrete example, I had a thing that I did recently where, so Co has a search box, you know, like everything has a search box. Um, you type words in and it finds you books that are applied to those words, um, just what you'd expect. Someone wanted a custom version of the search box because they wanted a tab that you could click and then it did a search on another system. Um, and that's all well and good. Our designer people made up this like, pretty HTML with clickable tabs and did all the stuff. Um, and we kind of, Put, we're about to put it in. We thought, oh, hang on, no, now we're going to have to like maintain a separate, separate template, um, and it's going to be a pain because uh, the one thing that's worse, at least in car, for maintaining than than sort of customization of code is customization of templates. Um, they're just a nightmare. So I kind of looked at it and thought, well, hang on, why don't we just make a make a configuration option and drop the HTML that we made into this configuration option and just have the logic say, well, if there's something in there, then put it in place of the search box. If there's nothing there, put the old search box there. Did that, and it worked, and it was fine. Um, and it means we're not carrying a separate sort of bit of customization. Upstream to the patch for the, the search box um, customization, and um, was it allowed to happen, and all oh, good. And then it happened a month later that somebody else wanted a similar thing. Oh, hey, we'd already done it. Chuck the, chuck the preference in, and good to go. Um, so. You should, if, if you ever come up with something that says, well, hey, this is just local, look and see if you can generalize it out. Um, keep the minimum amount of customization you can get away with. Sometimes you can't, which is a fact of life. Sometimes you're gonna be carrying around a bit of a brick. Um, technical debt, just can't pay it off. Um, so, yeah, you just have to bite the bullet and do it. So to turn all this around, we've been talking about or I've been talking about, um, how you as a sort of a person adding on to stuff should do it. What about projects themselves? What can they do to make it easy for people to want to give them code? Um, so I'll start with small projects because they're easy. Uh, use a public tracker. Um, I like Notorious, it's free software. Uh, GitHub's not too shabby too. Um, there's plenty of others. The key thing is that there is something where people can check out your code, perhaps look at a wiki with documentation. Um, 
report a bug, send a pull request, that sort of stuff. If that happens, watch for them. Keep an eye on those pull requests, keep an eye on those issues. Don't really care what you do with them, just reply. Make sure people get validated that, they're, that somebody's read their thing. Um, if it's a patch you can't use, say why you can't use it. If it's a patch that you can use, just hit the button that pulls into your code. Um, makes people happy, makes people want to come back and give you more things. Large projects, um, where you draw the line is up to you, but I'd say as soon as you get kind of a process, it's kind of the, the line between a small and large. Um, have a documented process. Make it easy for people to dive in. Have guides for setting up developer environments so people can build their, their, their thing and start making patches as quickly as possible. Have guides for submitting a patch. Um, there's probably going to be a, fl a, a flow to it. You're going to have to get sign off from somebody, get QA from somebody else. Release manager goes to it, does it. Have a guide so they know what to expect. Um, actually, on that note, uh, also guides covering your coding guidelines. Um, all those things that somebody jumping in that are obvious to you, things that somebody would want to know. Help the newcomers. You've always seen and heard about those mailing list flame wars and those IRC trolls who, when somebody comes in and says, how do I scramble the what's it? And uh, somebody says, RTFM, go away, and kicks them out of the channel. Um, don't be that person and don't be that project. Um, Help newcomers, if they're coming in, they're asking stupid questions, figure out the root cause of what they're trying to ask, because um, everybody's going to come in and say, how do I do this weird thing? And they actually think that that weird thing is the only thing they can do to achieve their goal, which is actually over here. So I've kind of bring it down to base, the base idea of what they're trying to achieve, and actually tell them the correct path. Um, if they're submitting patches, let them bypass parts of the process. Um, our project, Koha, has a fairly strict set of coding guidelines. Um, but for new people, we don't care. If they submit a patch, we take, take their patch, if it's appropriate, put it in, and then make another patch that fixes up the, the, the um, issues with theirs. And we tell them that we've done this so they know what's going on. Um, we don't just, you know, kick it back and let them sort of deal with it, and they just probably won't come back again if you do that. Um, so be helpful. Um, and just small things, fix them for them. Show them what you fixed and why. Um, this kind of boils down to be nice. Um, it can get kind of annoying when people come in asking the same stupid question over and over and over, but it's not hard, just, you know, delegate somebody else to do it for the, for the rest of the afternoon. Um, Handhold where you can, so walk people through the process, especially if it's their first one or two patches, just sort of say, Oh, okay, so make sure you've set the bug to, you know, need sign off. And maybe you want to, you know, send a message to the mailing list saying, hey, here's this feature I've written. Can somebody check it out for me and make sure it's all okay? Um, you know, just sort of prod them through the process. Recognize people for their contribution, going back to the vanity aspect. Um, we have uh, a history.txt file, and we put, you know, Joe Bloggs is the 123rd committer to Koha when they get a patch in. Um, and that's there for eternity then. Um, and it shows up inside the release notes inside the application. Um, and it just makes people feel good. They see their name in lights. Um, so the guts of it is, making it, for making it easy, is to just have a good experience. Give people a good experience and make them come back. Um, if they have a good experience the first once or twice, they're so much more likely to come back. And once they've done that, then they know the system. They don't need your handholding anymore. They're going to become the person who handholds the next person along. Um, so, yeah, just be nice, be friendly, and encourage people to come along and be part of your community. So, as I said at the start, this is aiming to be more of a discussion-y sort of thing. These are just my ideas, speculations. Um, I want your opinions as well. So, have at it. Uh, yeah? In what way are the librarians different from other people? Are they building their own thing? In what way are, are librarians different? Uh, is it a special breed of people who are stubborn to build their own? No. I don't think they're that different. Um, there are definite differences. Um, 
They are, they are probably, as a rule, maybe a little bit more change-averse, but then there's, the other, there's some that are change, really change-averse and some that are the complete and utter opposite and want this shiny new thing all the time. Um, the one thing I think that is different about library people than other sort of people to oh, hugely generalize is more that they tend to be um, kind of open to, like, change of us, but open to new ideas, understanding kind of the sort of free software methodology. Um, they're really open to, oh, you want to send that to the rest of the community? Go for it. You would love that. That's, that's great. Um, whereas we do have other people who are a bit more, oh, I don't know, do we really want to be, that doesn't, I don't know, that doesn't sound, that sounds weird. What are you thinking of? Um, whereas libraries being a sort of a font of, no, font of knowledge kind of idea tend to be quite okay with the idea of sharing. Um, yeah, that's sort of the main difference I've noticed. Cool. Anyone else? Nope. Thank you. Thank you.